All right. Welcome everyone to my session, Cash Me If You Can, speeding up your JVM with Project Valhalla. As I mentioned in the intro, I'll be discussing the details of OpenJDK's Project Valhalla and how it will be used to speed up the JVM when it is released. You'll get the most out of this talk if you have some familiarity with Java and the internals, but I'll do my best to explain along the way. And if you do have questions, one of my colleagues, Hong Sho, who is an advisory software engineer at IBM and is an expert on both JVMs and Project Valhalla, um, is there to help as well. Um, again, my name is Teresa Mamarella. I'm also a software engineer at IBM, and myself and Hong both work on the Runtimes team um, on specifically on Eclipse Open J9, and we've both been involved in Valhalla support for this project. All right, just to jump right in. So to give you some background on why this project is important and what it's trying to solve. So in the early days of Java, when the Java virtual machine was being designed, the cost of a memory fetch was comparable in magnitude to that of um, a, an arithmetic operation, such as addition. Uh, if you've been paying attention at all over the last 30 years to um, how hardware has evolved, you will know that that is very much not the case anymore. Um, in fact, it can cost as much as a thousand times the, the time it takes to do an arithmetic operation to do a memory fetch. This is quite a significant change and, and does have um, quite an impact on our software. So the reason this has all happened is because CPUs have been scaling with Moore's law, which is the principle that the speed and capability of a, a computer can be expected to double every two years. Um, memory performance has increased slightly through other means. Um, in particular, the architecture has changed significantly over time to take advantage of caching. And caches take advantage of um, the trade-off between speed and uh, size when it comes to fetching data in memory. So closest to the CPU, there will be a a small amount of memory that can be used to um, access pieces of memory very quickly. Further down, there will be something slightly larger that's a little bit slower and so on and so on until you get to uh, the drive. Um, now there has been a significant amount of work done to, to improve the speed of, of Java over the years and it is still um, a very fast language. Um, so the situation is not as dire as, as this uh, this chart may, may lead you to believe, um, but there is more work that can be done here. So to give you an example of how um, the caching can really affect a program and why it's important to take advantage of cache locality, I have um, an example here to share. So on the left, we have a program that is not Java, it's C++. And on the right is a chart measuring how many times um, an increment to a, a portion of, of this array happens. So the outer loop is, is not being measured. Um, that is just to, to repeat the, the program over and over again. And as you'll see in the top left corner um, where increments per second is happening very often, this is the speed of this is actually limited by uh, the CPU, and you'll see that as the the size of the array gets bigger and bigger, um, that number of increments increase because the outer loop starts to have less significance on um, on the program speed. All right, but you'll see soon that it takes a pretty dramatic drop. Um, and what happens here is that in the first section, the array size fits within the smallest, fastest cache, typically referred to as the, the L1 or the level one cache. Um, and once that array gets too big, there starts to be cache, cache misses, and then they, it will take longer to fetch data, and the speed is then limited by the, that size of the L1 cache. You'll see over time, the, speed, the uh, performance continues to drop, um, as 
the array gets bigger and bigger, and as we need to have more and more cache misses. All right, so let's talk about what objects look like in the JVM and how that might affect um, what goes into memory. So Java is an object-oriented language. Objects are instances of a class, and they are related to each other um, from, from the stack by pointers. Pointers are really useful in that it lets us represent null very easily, for example. Um, but if you want to access a deeply nested field or many fields, you need to dereference quite a few pointers. And eventually, in a large program, there will be many references um, in the heap. They make a large, make up a large part of the heap footprint in, in the JVM. And because we're using pointers, there is no guarantee that objects may be positioned near each other in memory. So accessing objects has the potential to be inefficient. That something that logically makes sense to be uh, near each other may, may be in a completely different cache or, or in uh, memory. And one reason for this is that there is a separation of concerns in the JDK. There are many different pieces that don't necessarily know each other and they handle their own um, piece of a, a more complicated puzzle. Um, for example, the garbage collector, which handles cleaning up memory and placing uh, that memory illogically in a heap, doesn't actually know about all of these references for the most part. Um, and so it makes it, it can make it difficult to take advantage of this, the spatial locality um, in, in memory. Um, another thing to note about Java objects is that they have a small header that contains some important information that we'll get into next. Um, and this can also increase the footprint on the heap make it more likely that there will be more GC cycles happening and make it more likely that all this, these objects cannot fit onto the cache. All right, so what information is in these headers? Well, one important piece of information is the identity of an object. In Java, every object is unique. If you've ever written any kind of Java program, you will likely have run into a problem at some point where you used an equals equals operator instead of a equals method. And this is a great example of some awareness that we need to have for identity because that equals equals compares the, the ID of an object, compares whether or not it's the exact same object, um, and the equals generally will compare the values in an object. Identity is important because by having a unique object, it allows us to have a mutable fields and be able to synchronize on these objects, which are, are very key features that are used very often in Java. In a Valhalla world, these traditional classes um, that are typically just known as classes are, are now called identity classes. But the question is here, do we really need identity all the time? Um, and it depends on the situation. For example, if in my application, my business logic, I need to represent a person and compare groups of people, do I need to have unique objects for each person? It depends on what's being represented there. If I'm just talking about how many software engineers are in the room, maybe I don't. But um, if I'm talking about healthcare information, then having those objects be unique is probably pretty important. And what about things like currency? If I'm talking about dollar bills, most likely it's not that important to represent dollars as unique objects. Another example where you may not need identity is um, representing a point in space or a line. So you have two points and for, usually it doesn't matter uh, which point is which or the order of them or there's there's no reason that that these need to be unique. Um, and so with Project Valhalla, the idea is that if we forego the identity of an object, it allows us to get rid of that object header information, 
and those pointer references that and create less indirection and be able to flatten those types in memory. So basically representing this object more as a primitive um, than as a traditional Java object. So on the right, you'll see that these four uh, pieces of data that make up uh, the coordinates of a line can instead be exist right next to each other in memory as integers. This provides a very flat layout, which is cache efficient and a dense memory efficient layout without compromising um, the abstraction or the type safety that, that is valued in Java. So how can we represent this in the JVM? So the first JEP um, that has been introduced in Project Valhalla that is, is not targeted for a release at this time is JEP 401 value classes. And pretty simply, it is introducing a class without identity. And because that class doesn't have identity, there are a few very important restrictions uh, to keep in mind these types of classes that have to do with identity. So the first one is that classes and instant fields are implicitly final. We talked about previously that identity um, allows us to have mutable fields. And so without identity, these, these classes, these fields um, are gonna be set in stone when and initialized. Synchronization on these objects is also not allowed without identity. The equals equals operator takes on a new meaning for a value class since there is no longer an identity to compare. Um, so it will, with value classes, have the same behavior as uh, dot equals method, um, at least when, when that by default, so comparing the values. The next thing to note about value classes is that they are nullable. Um, and this will make more sense why I'm talking about this in a few minutes, but this is different than a primitive. Primitives always have some kind of default value, but for value classes, they, they are able to be nullable. They must also be accessed atomically. Um, and this is basically to make that flattening that we talked about flattening in memory easier. The fourth property is that they may be flattened by the JVM. It's important to say that flattening, even though the user may declare a value class by putting the value operator in front of a class, as I've shown in the code example here, it's never guaranteed. Um, and one of the biggest limiters is the size of the object um, because the object needs to be accessed atomically. And it depends on the, the platform, what size this is going to be, but the, the default policy is, is sometimes going to be as small as, as 32 bits. So the object needs to be very, very small. Um, and in fact, in OpenJ9 implementation, we don't even flatten these types of default value classes just because it hasn't um, seemed to, to pay off a lot because it is very rare to have um, a, a useful value object that's that's that going to be that small. And to make matters worse, when one of the big problems is that when representing null, so as I mentioned earlier, um, when we have pointers to objects, it's easy to represent null because you can just have uh, a null pointer. But with flattened value objects, null must be represented. Um, typically, it's it's being done with an extra bit to represent it, uh, and because of memory alignment issues, that can mean that one bit turns into 32, uh, making that object quite a bit bigger than it needs to be. So to help shrink these value classes a bit, the second JEP, that's or the Java enhancement proposal um, that's going into Project Valhalla is null restricted value classes. So instead of having a, a nullable class, that's a value class, we're making it even closer to the behavior of a primitive and making it so a value class cannot be null. Um, but if it's not null, then, then what is it going to be? So if you have 
a primitive integer in Java, for example, and you don't give it any value, it always resolves to zero. So the same idea comes with null restricted value classes. They must always have some kind of default field values. Um, and these have to be opted into through the Java language, at least that's the, the design at the moment. So in order to declare that a field is, field is null restricted for a value class, um, it's needed to have this exclamation point in front of it. And in order for that to be valid, uh, the value class must have an implicit constructor and that indicates that there will be default, there can be default value set if there's no other constructor that applies. And by restricting null for value classes, it makes it so that there is a higher chance that flattening can occur for objects. To give an even better chance to, to value objects to be flattened depending on the size, um, there's also a relaxation in the policy that value classes need to be accessed atomically. Um, you may or may not know that primitives such as long and double, they are not accessed atomically. So it only makes sense that uh, value classes can have this option as well. Um, and so that can be opted into as well for a value class by implementing the loosely consistent value. And it means that if there is a race condition a new class instances may accidentally be created and have intermixing field values. But if the developer is okay with that risk, they can opt in um, and tolerate non-atomic accesses, which can lead to having bigger flattened classes. All right, so that is a very quick introduction to the first two JEPs that are around value classes in Valhalla. I have a couple of takeaways um, for you to think about if, if you're interested or think that it may be valuable to your application in the future. Um, so first of all, given given what, what you know about value classes, thinking about when it might make sense to migrate a data carrier class um, to a value class, records are maybe pretty good candidates as well. Um, in the future, along with JEP 401, it's proposed that some core libraries will be considered to be value classes in future releases. Um, another set of them that, that has been in existence since Java 8 is there are there is a concept of value-based classes now in in the JDK um, that have unofficially the same rest restrictions as value classes, but they're not yet enforced. So something to keep in mind when thinking about whether this may be something useful in the future. There are builds available to try out with Project Valhalla. Um, this project is still in the experimentation phase. And right now there is a call out to get input from interested Java developers in the community. Um, a great help would be to try out prototypes and share experiences. Uh, this project will be a, potentially a big benefit to applications that do a lot of numeric computation, linear algebra, and machine learning. And there is potential as well to have improvements in the, the JDK itself um, by migrating core libraries to value classes and also with uh, compiler optimizations that were more difficult before um, these types of classes existed. So I've included some links here. There are OpenJDK early access builds available. Um, I would encourage you to read the release notes carefully because there have been a lot of changes happening with uh, value types over the years. Um, it's also possible to build, to build value type support with OpenG9. I've included instructions here as well. And that is all that I have for you today. And please send your questions in the chat and I will do my best to answer them. Thank you.